Father and God's presence, some of the words that came in this, this profound was the reality of us hearing the cry of God's heart. So I want to talk to you this morning about getting your voice back. And what is essential about this is not going to be a preach. Some of us preaching, we think, you know, if you're shouting, you're preaching, if you're teaching, you talk softly. I'm hoping to teach this morning more than what I want to preach. So I trust that you've got your notebook ready because I'm, I'm bound to mess with your head right now. You know right? I want you to go home to have a look at the scriptures again and say, no, this cannot be. What that man said cannot be. I reckon I'm going to cause some turmoil on the inside of you that I want you to go home with and fight with God. Please don't fight with me. You are right with that? I hope it's not to offend, but it's very possible that as I'm reading the words, you might get offended with me. Please don't get offended with me. Please get offended with the word. Fight with the word. Let's see who wins that battle. You're right. Sure, man. Mark, so great to see you guys again. It's been a long season of you fighting and standing by fight. Amazing to see you guys in the real life. Bless you. So, Holy Spirit, I just welcome you. I ask for your presence, I ask for your anointing. God, I pray this morning that we will hear your word in That we will hear the word about Christ. That our hearts will be full of fire. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So let me just introduce this morning this way. I know there's some YouTube live guys visiting us online. If you can't hear me, I'm sorry, you're going to have to be free. But uh, I trust that you'll get the whole day out on your side. Talking about getting your say back, there's a, there's a critical understanding that I want to lay a foundation on. And as we start to read scripture together this morning, we're going to build on that foundation. Now, when it comes to getting your voice back, it's so important that you understand headship theology or representative theology. What does it mean? It means that when God deals with humanity, He's dealt in essence only with two men that represented all of our concerns and cares. That's what it means. Isn't God efficient? He's so efficient. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Adam and he's going to be the representative for all of humanity. I'm going to look to his life and whatever he does, humanity will get the benefit. That's the one representative that's available to you and to me. The other representative, the Bible speaks of him as the last Adam. He is Christ. He is Jesus. He's the anointed man. Now that's, a, that's another man that came to this earth to represent humanity. So that's what the theologians call headship theology. Is these two representatives. On the one hand, you have the man Adam. He comes into a perfect world, a perfect setting, with a perfect life, with everything going for him, and he messes it up. So, sir, you don't have to swap your wife out to be happy. Adam had the most beautiful girl ever made in the world, and he stuck it up. But that's that representative. Because of his representation, because of how he disobeyed God, because of how he sinned, death is accounted to everyone that remains in him. Happiness? The other representative was Jesus Christ. He comes into a battle, he comes into a challenging world, nothing goes for him, but he stays perfectly obedient. Even dying on the cross. And if you look to him this morning as your representative, then God will deal with you and all of humanity based on what he's done. You're right. Now Paul says, this is where he gets his, his in Christ theology from. He says you've got basically two options. You've got born into this head, into this representative, but you don't have to stay there. It's good news. If you're willing to die to your old representative,
representative and he will allow your new representative to give you birth, to give you life again, then you get born under a new representative and he will represent you. And everything he's done, he's done for you and you can still be drawn up at Happy? That's deep theology. I trust it's simply explained. So the big question is, who are you then? Are you submitting to this representative? Are you in this representative? Or are you living in this new representative, Jesus Christ? So if you're going to have your say, if you're going to get your say back, you're going to have to get a new representative and you're going to have to understand what he's afforded you. That's my preach in two minutes. Let me pray go on. So let's unpack this a little bit. Let's read scripture together. Let's answer this question. The first question is what did mankind have say over? What did the first representative have say over? What was God's original intent when he made you? What is the thing that you could have spoken over? What did you have say over? Are you ready for us to answer that question? Genesis chapter 2. What did you have said over through your representative? What was God's original intent? For the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about getting your say back. This morning, I'm hoping to, for you to discover that you've got a say because of your position under your new representative. Then I want us to look at how do you get your say back over provision? How cool would that be? It's key to hear that. Come next week. <laughs> You can get your say back this morning. I want you to realize that you've got a position with a new representative. And what does that mean? But you can actually start to use your voice. Genesis chapter 2. The book of the beginning. Let's read together from verse 8. Genesis 2. Let me bless you. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God let all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, good and evil. So far so good. God says everything mankind needs, every provision that you will need for your physical body, Provided. It's good for food. The trees God provides is good for food to Adam. It's the equivalent of having a, a woolworth around the corner. Everything you need to feed you physically is in place. But also it's pleasing to the eye. In other words, it's good for your soul. Everything you need to be happy, God has provided for you. So in verse 15, the story continues and it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, and he said, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a suitable help for it. How incredibly kind is God. He blesses your body, he blesses your soul and he says, I'm not going to give you a living alone. I'm going to make you a beautiful creature for your wife to help you. Verse 19 says, listen to how the original technology was designed. Verse 19 says, now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the air, and to all the beasts of the field. Isn't that amazing? God's original intent was that because of our representative, creation would respond to your voice. As Adam calls it, so it is. God says, my intention for all humanity through you, Adam, is that technology that, that Apple will discover many years later is that creation will become 
voice control. Your voice. What's the matter? Perhaps you're taking notes because I see that years are starting to tick now. Like, oh, God. No, how's that? But that was God's original intent. Creation was designed to respond to your voice. How good is that? How awesome is that? So what did you have say over? What did, what did mankind have say over? What was God's original intent? Did you read what I read? You and I were supposed to, to speak over, to, to have say over everything that you can see visibly created. We don't know who we are anymore. 
Look at the transgender motive that's running through the world today. People choosing, I, I want to be this. It's the evidence that you've lost what God has originally intended for you. And you're so confused, you don't know where you need to fit in. We lost our destiny. Why were we here? To make money, most of us believe. And so we chased that rabbit. But what we lost more than anything without us realizing is we lost our ability to have a son. To have the visible creation respond to your lips. It is so far lost. Some of you are thinking, looking at me as like, this man is preaching something that's different. Are you honest? Never heard that before. You guys are being polite. You don't know what I'm saying. You were born to have a say. You were made to have a say. We lost our say to the enemy. How did we lose it? Our representative disobeyed. And you and I are still facing the consequence of his disobedience. Some of us think if I just keep doing what I'm doing, then maybe my life is going to get better. So I've got bad news for you this morning. Your representative introduced sin, your representative introduced death, and you will remain dead if you don't choose a new representative. How amazing is Jesus? He obeys God in everything. Saying, listen, I'm realizing this is a weighty matter. I've got all of humanity carrying that I'm carrying on my shoulder right now. I, I cannot step one foot out of line. I need to obey God in everything. In everything. I need to obey even to death on the cross. And as he dies there, he says, It is finished. The old representative, none void. As a new representative. And everything that you lost, you got given back in Christ. What an awesome privilege. What an awesome privilege. You don't believe me? Let's turn quickly to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. Look at how Paul is using the representative language. Help you understand how you lost your say. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles with. It is so much more fun when you find it. I know this one seems to be solid. Sometimes it feels like okay. this one never does. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, or 42. Let's read together from verse 42. Paul is dealing with what happens to your body. Because under this old representative, your body is going to have to now, it can't go past 120. It's got limited lifetime. But because of this new representative, there's stuff, even while you look for 120, that your new representative will upgrade this piece of gold. So he's dealing with these two representatives. This is what I'm saying in verse 42 of 1 Corinthians 15. So someone will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is so imperishable. Uh, the body is sown, the body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised in spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man from heaven. Deep theology, yeah? What is Paul saying? He says, listen, just choose your representative. Who's going to represent you? The first Adam? That just simply brings death, and at best, he's just a living being. God had to breathe into his nostrils 
get in the way. If you choose him as your representative, then death is your destiny. You're not going to be able to hear God. You're not going to be able to, to feel God. You're not going to be able to walk with God. Why? Because you're dead to God because of your representative. But, good news. Please don't align this in your Bible. There's the last Adam. Please don't align it. The last one. It means there's not going to be another one. Aren't you grateful for that? There's not going to be another Adam. Jesus is the last one. He did everything that he had to undo from the first one. And he, by the way, is a life-giving spirit. If you get him as a representative, all of God's spiritual life. Woo! That's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, have you got a conservative background? I'm messing with the head a little bit. Because for as long as I grew up, I just wanted to come to church, otherwise, I'm in trouble with the Lord. <laughs> but only much later that I realized oh my goodness, He's a life giving spirit. As I hear happen as a representative, I can feel him in my body. He lives inside of me. I can start to hear him. I can start to walk with power just like he did because he's a life-giving spirit. Now he says, he's mocked this with me, he says, The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man was from heaven. The first representative as a man came out of the dust of the earth. The second man, Jesus, with this incredible body comes from heaven. You know that that body is waiting for you. Please note this. There's the first Adam and the last Adam. Happiness? Then he says there's a first man and a second man, which means there can be a third man and a fourth man and a sixth man and a seventh man. An eleventh man for all of creation is wrapped up in this new life. You and I can be those men. Jesus was the second man, and now we can be the third, and the fourth, and the sixth, and the seventh. You're getting my drift? Maybe my point? There's only two heads, two representative God looks to you. And if you look to this new representative, you can be like that man. You can live like that man. That's a deep theological point. I trust I'm blessed to you. It's turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. How did you lose your son? You're still trying to answer this question. How did you lose your son? Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Paul says if you make and choose a new representative, 
And you can come before God based on what He's done. You can have everything of His life that can be to your Isn't that amazing? The gospel of you. I think the gospel is amazing. Why is it called it? Your representative determines your side. You make it up? Your representative determines your side. Why is it called? If you choosing Adam to be your representative, then you will speak without any authority. Follow? Why? Because he lost his side to Satan. try to speak to disease, speak to demons, speak to things, and it's like, it doesn't seem to work. Why? Because you say, I believe in Jesus, but actually most of your life is still submitted to your own representative. I want my way, bless my body, bless my place, bless my soul, the way I want it, I want it. You're just a fleshly believer. And as long as you keep blessing your flesh, you submit to your own representative. Am I making friends and influencing people right now? Yeah. If you choose to submit to Jesus, your new representative, if you're willing to die to everything of this old representative, if you're willing to die to your flesh and say yes to God, yes to godliness, yes to everything, what do you think is going to happen in the world? What do you think is possible in your life? Because all of creation was made through him. When he speaks, they listen. So if, you represent, if your representative acts that way and you can line yourself up with him, what do you think becomes possible for you? Because God deals with you according to your representative. Creation responds to you like they do to their creator. And by the way, the Bible says you should represent them. I know this is challenging theology. I trust it, but it's landing simple enough on us. You know what makes the church powerless? We believe in this representative. Oh, if I, I'm going to make it to heaven because I've, I've chosen Jesus. But you know what? I'm just going to live in the world a little bit longer. And we wonder why the church is so powerless. You wonder why your faith doesn't seem to produce anything. Because we say now, Jesus, I've got my final assurance. One day when I get to the gates of heaven, they ask me why do I need to get in? Oh, Jesus died for me. But I'm going to have a party while living in this world. Let's choose. Who's your representative? And then yield to him fully. Give everything to him fully. See what he will do with your walk. See what he will do with your son. You still good? Yeah. Still awake? Yeah. Visitors, you still happy? Preaching you mad, not preaching you sad, preaching you happy. <laughs> Next question. Who has the say right now? It's a big question. Who has the say of a visible creation right now? Nobody will pass it. So, now you need to go slowly. Now you need to make notes. Now I'm going to mess with you. You're up. So now I'm going to answer. You're up. There's a resounding yes from that wall. Let's go. Who's got the say right now? Who's got the say of a visible creation right now? Who says God? Who's got the say of a visible creation right now? Who says Satan? Tell us. The rest of you, the outsiders, <laughs> God and Satan is a means of you. 
what the Bible say? Who stopped the sale of a visible human? Let's do it. Let's do it. To Luke chapter 4. Now, this is where you're going to fight with the Bible. Are you going to fight with me? Please fight with the Bible. Luke chapter 4. Now, this is the story of representative representation. The first one had it perfect. Everything was in place. Everything was good. He was in the place God wanted him to be, and everything was amazing, and yet he lost it. Second representative, he comes into chaos. He's alone. He's hungry. He's in the desert. What do you think happens to him? Luke chapter 4, verse 5 says, The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Who gave all the authority and the splendor of the kingdoms of the world to say? Who? This guy. The first Adam. In a moment of disobedience, he gave away far more than what he realized. So who's got to say right now over this visible world that you're now living? Say So why are you mad at God when things in this world doesn't work the way you think it should? Why are you mad at God when death and disease and, and, and poverty hits you? Why are you mad at God? Why do you blame Him? Your, 
Why are you getting free from your addictions? Because you think this thing is only based on what I see in the natural. No, 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 sir. It's time for you to get delivered from those influences that's forcing your hand to submit to a moral representative when actually God says, if you simply die, you'll have victory. It's amazing that the Bible says the battle is the Lord's and the victory is yours. Jesus battled everything that was lost. He battled to get it back. It cost him his life. You can stand on the victory this morning. Gospel is getting better news as we go, so <laughs> getting better and better. Some of you are still not convinced. I prepared the scripture specifically for you. 1 John 5, verse 19. 1 John 5. Who has got say over the visible creation right now? Because we all believe the gospel, don't we? We believe what happened to Jesus, but we, we never learn to apply the gospel. That's why I'm messing with you. I'm helping you to apply the gospel, not just to know it, but to apply it. It's too well, isn't it? But you get to have your say that. 1 John 5, verse 19. It says this in verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil. Now listen, I don't know how to say the plain out because in this one or two Jews suit you to go. This whole visible world that you and I live in the Bible has just said it's under the control of the evil. Does it surprise you that things don't work in this world? Does it surprise you that sickness is trying to get us to be intimidated? Does it surprise you that control is trying to reach in and control your life at every angle? Does it surprise you that fear is the default setting of humanity? Does it surprise you where there's death and destruction and abortion doesn't surprise you. The enemy is a master deceiver. There's some Afrikaans words that describes him to a T. But I don't want to offend you more with my language than what the word is offending you already, so I want to use that this more. But he's a deceiving. You can fill it. Got you so. <laughs> You're right. Thank you. Are you happy? You should be getting happier. Because you've got your say. You've got your say back. You're discovering that you have a voice. That God is waiting for you. Creation is waiting for you. You can speak in a little circumstance and actually go home and transform them simply by how you speak. Siri has got nothing on you. <laughs> Siri says, I can help you ask her a question. Oh, no, I couldn't find that answer. Have you been there? Your representative doesn't work that way. Your say, a little note for you, your say gets determined by who you submit to. Your say gets determined by who you submit to. Are you submitting to your old representative? Well, no. No. Well, the right word is true. Why do you find it surprising that your wife doesn't want to submit to you? Because there's nothing worthwhile following. Because your say is determined on who you submit to. If you submit to your old representative, you're only going to abuse. But if you can submit to your new representative and start to speak as he's speaking, so you know what? Your wife is going to come alive. Man, your husband will actually start to believe in himself because you start to believe in him. All things become possible 
Vice Lord's new representative. I don't want to get stuck in the ark. What did Jesus do to give you your voice back, to give you your say back? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> what did God do about it? What did God do about it? Did He leave you stuck inside of that kind of For some of us, did that. We blame God when things go wrong. Where was He? What was He doing? Where was He not? Where was He? Blah, 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 blah. What did God do? What did Jesus do to give you a savior? John chapter 3. You know the scripture? You don't have to be in church for a long time to know this scripture. John chapter 3. You want to guess the first? You over educate. Time for us to get active now. John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. As a representative for humanity. Have you accepted him? Does he represent you? Do you represent him? Because if you represent him as he is, so are you in this world. That's a crazy thing. That's a crazy thing. As he is, so are you. Don't ask that question about it. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. What was God's solution to your problem? He says, listen, I can answer your small little prayers, but ultimately mankind needs a new representative of sent on one another. That one brought death. This one brings life. It's life that will last for eternity. If already has got nothing on his life. <laughs> what did Jesus do about it? Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Are you still alive, church? Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot that you're busy processing. I'm trusting that the anointing. God's Spirit is getting you to understand that. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. What did Jesus do to give you your Savior? Romans 3, verse 21. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. The question this morning is, do you believe? Do you believe you have a new representative and you have what he offers? There's no difference, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and to, to be the one who justifies those who have faith. What did Jesus do to give you a savior? He gave his blood to pay for the disobedience. You still wonder whether he loves you? You know how much he must love to sacrifice himself on the earth? You still doubt whether I've got value in God, sending his own son playing with his blood, how much more valuable would you want to be? If you don't feel love based on that, Matt, there's no chance your husband will be able to do it.
What did Christ do? Matthew 28, verse 18. What did Christ do to, to help you get your say back? Matthew 28, verse 18.
Now this is this is messy. Because sometimes I do something about faith and it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to produce the result. Sometimes my dog doesn't want to even listen to me. <laughs> now you're expecting me to speak to Christ. You feel like that. So how do we do it? How do we get our savor? We put faith in this new representative. We say, as he's done so, it is for me. So faith always speaks, and faith always acts. It always does something. So how do you get to, how do you get the say back? Get it back by faith. So how do you fight this? Galatians 5 verse 15. Next week we're going to look at getting your sight out of your provision. 
It's important that you start here this way. Take the same academic position. No one represents you. I believe there's more about the piece of response. We just so afraid of getting out of the line. It's like if I cover, if I blow my cover, what am I going to hide here? It's a moment for you and God. You're not going to make me feel better over that shit or not, whether you respond or not. Just be honest with God. Right? You still find yourself hiding. 